We are going to move right into our morning uh, keynote. So I would like to welcome Tom Barkin, who is the President and Chief Executive Officer of the Richmond Fed. He joined the Richmond Fed in January of 2018. He was a senior partner and chief financial officer at McKinsey, as well as serving on the board of directors for the Federal Reserve Bank of Atlanta, and is a member of the Emory University Board of Trustees with degrees from Harvard University. Please welcome President Barkin. Thanks, Don. Um, good morning, and uh, thanks to all of you for having me here to speak with you today. Um, what I'd love to do is to tell you a little bit about my background, perspective, and then I'll share some thoughts on the economy and the Fed's progress on meeting our dual mandate objectives. I'll close with some comments on the implications for monetary policy. Before I say more, I have to note that the views I express are my own and not necessarily those of my colleagues on the FOMC or the Federal Reserve System. If you want to know what their views are, Jay is testifying right now. I joined the, Federal, the Richmond Fed last January after 30 years in consulting at McKinsey, uh, where I was the CFO and letter offices in the South. I've spent my professional life helping firms make decisions about hiring, about compensation, and about prices, and I've made a lot of those decisions myself. So I hope I'm bringing a different perspective to the FOMC. My colleagues on the committee are some of the most talented macroeconomists, bankers, academics, and financial regulators in the country. But as the only committee member with my experience, I hope to approach things differently. One thing I've learned, uh, both from my experience in business and from my time at the Fed, if it flies away, I won't learn it, is that confidence matters. As a consultant and as a CFO myself, I saw clearly that confidence was critical for businesses to want to invest and for markets to be willing to finance that investment. Now I hear the same thing as I meet in my district with business leaders. It's true on the consumer side as well. Common sense suggests, and economists have shown, that confidence is also essential for consumers to spend on big ticket items. A sudden pullback in their expectations could easily affect consumer spending. I also believe that today, confidence is both more important and more volatile than it used to be. Both good and bad news diffuse significantly more quickly and broadly. We surf the news on our phones 10 times or more a day, and the business media is everywhere, even on planes. But more news doesn't necessarily equate to more confidence. Relative to a few decades ago, consumers are more exposed and therefore more sensitive. They're more directly invested in the stock market particularly in index funds that move with the market rather than company fundamentals. Many households might also still be scarred by the Great Recession. Overall, they're saving at rates twice what they did in 2007. In addition, the business reaction function has gotten faster. Short-termism has increased as activism in the market for corporate control has shifted companies' focus. Just as with consumers, I think firms' resilience is down. They start with lower confidence, another hangover from the Great Recession. At the same time, business people tell me the length of the current upturn makes them nervous that another recession must be right around the corner. The speed of the, of the reaction function may be exacerbated by higher leverage. Corporate debt as a percentage of GDP is at all-time highs. Levered companies and their creditors have a bias toward taking action on negative news. This can mean cutting costs, reducing staff, or pricing for volume. Taken together, all these factors lead to an asymmetry in which firms are much more cautious about the downside than they are optimistic about the upside. Perhaps both consumers and businesses have a higher bar for spending decisions. It's possible that some of the tepid recovery from the Great Recession was a self-fulfilling lack of belief in the strength of the economy. Firms' feel of fear of failure could have prevented them from making investments even in the presence of reasonable returns. This negative tilt or asymmetry continues today. Firms are frustrated with political polarization and uncertainty about trade and regulation. This limits their pricing courage and caps the upside on their spending and investment decisions. For these reasons, a drop in confidence could lead to lower investment, lower output, and eventually lower employment. If employment's placed at risk, consumption won't be far behind, and that would place us in more serious difficulty. Put another way, I don't discount the idea that we could talk ourselves into a recession. And in fact, I think our economy is struggling with confidence today. 
As we heard earlier, 2018 was great. The unemployment rate reached historic lows. The economy added more than 220,000 jobs a month. Inflation ran for a time at our 2% target, and GDP growth was stronger than it's been in years. But as we entered 2019, I started to hear a lot of concern. I said at the time, the times were good, but the mood was bad. Well, there were certainly a number of things you could be nervous about, including trade tensions, a slowdown in China, Brexit, market volatility, just to name a few, and especially in the United States, politics. The federal government shutdown hit confidence hard, and I believe this impacted the numbers at the beginning of the year. But the shutdown ended. Brexit was delayed. Trade deals looked to be settling. International economies seemed to be on the mend. Markets bounced back. Perhaps the, perhaps the FOMC's shift to a patient stance helped. Accordingly, we saw consumer confidence indices bounce back, and that showed up in the consumption data. Consumers still feel confident, have jobs, and are willing to spend. And remember, that's 70% of the economy. But the roller coaster for business confidence continues. Trade tensions have escalated again, and threats of Mexico tariffs hit business confidence hard. How can you manage your supply chain when you don't know what its cost will be? Mexico may have seen a reprieve most recently, but uncertainty remains around trade talks with the European Union, Japan, and of course China. And if tariffs are indeed a tool for a variety of objectives, we will be in a persistently more uncertain place. More broadly, as discussed earlier, Brexit is back with the potential to be even messier than we were anticipating. International economies are weakening again. The federal debt ceiling still hasn't been lifted. And even more than a year out from the next election, I hear business leaders getting nervous about the political noise. All these anxieties have the potential to build. All told, business confidence is fragile, uncertainty is increasing, and I'm increasingly concerned about both. And if they deteriorate further, that could affect growth, investment, pricing, and employment. Well, in the presence of a strong economy but fragile confidence, what can a central bank do? We can aim to deliver on our mandates for maximum employment and price stability, which in turn create an environment stable for businesses and stable for consumers. In such an environment, few consumers face the risk of job loss and destruction, disruption, and low and steady inflation makes tomorrow's prices uninteresting, so that business as usual can continue today. At present, I think it's safe to say we're doing well on our employment mandate. Of course, there are still people who want to work who can't find a job, and troubling disparities across racial, ethnic, and regional lines. But overall, the labor market is historically strong. With respect to price stability, core PC inflation has been running persistently below our 2% target. To be frank, I'm torn about how large a concern this presents. On one hand, some of the current low inflation is due to transitory factors, such as changes in the methodology for calculating apparel prices. Part is also due to this first quarter confidence shock I discussed, which likely limited firms' pricing courage. On the other hand, running system systemically below the target feels like a problem that should be addressed. But if you will give me a third hand, we just if we just reported with no decimals, we would be at target, and we would have been in most years. You might say we're a victim of our own high standards. I'm old enough to remember the 70s and 80s and the painful lengths the Fed went to tame inflation. Running within a few tenths of a point of a 2% target would have seemed unimaginable to the Fed leaders at that time. Looking at the big picture, inflation has been and continues to be low and steady and not the concern of businesses nor consumers. And that's the real goal. Let me turn now to some of the factors that determine inflation. The standard economic theory is clear enough about the short run. Interest rate moves affect the real economy with some lag. In turn, these Changes to the real economy affect inflation through the Phillips curve. As firms pay more for labor, they raise prices accordingly. Over the longer run, credible monetary authorities set and build a track record of delivering against inflation expectations, which become a benchmark for businesses and consumers. OK, that sounds good. Um, I was in business for 30 years. How do I think inflation works in practice? Most companies in most industries have settled pricing routines that are slow to change. These routines begin with inflation expectations and are also grounded in what firms perceive about their competitors and customers' reaction functions. Costs matter, of course, as the Phillips curve implies, and are particularly important when they're highly visible and industry-wide, as was the case with steel tariffs or with a spike in oil prices. 
But right now, the Phillips curve doesn't look to be having the effect on pricing one might expect. Part of that is perhaps because the labor share of content has declined in many industries, making labor costs less of a factor. I would also point to what firms perceive about their ability to raise prices uh, for their customers. This isn't a big issue in most service businesses, like construction or a barbershop, where higher wages create a margin squeeze that more directly drive higher prices. But it's worth taking a look at consumer goods, particularly durable goods, where inflation has been basically non-existent for 25 years. Big box stores have taken share by building their strategy around low prices and achieved that strategy by exerting significant pressure on their suppliers. Firms' purchasing departments have become increasingly sophisticated, leveraging global supply chains and private label alternatives. Internet transparency has made it easy for consumers to shop around and for new entrants to challenge established firms on price. And, as I've discussed, even with inflation expectations well-grounded for the economy as a whole, lack of confidence can affect firms' willingness to raise prices in their particular sector. But corporate margins are up. How can this be happening when prices are being squeezed? Firms are investing significantly in efforts to capture more effective price without raising list price, reducing the thread count in a sweater, introducing new premium products, say craft beers, reducing discretionary terms, or adding on extra fees, all have been ways firms have been able to maintain or even increase their margins without raising prices. Our metrics reflect some of these, but not all of them. So what are the implications of this for monetary policy? Uh, expectations are deeply grounded in firms' pricing routines. This became clear in 2009 during the downturn when prices didn't drop as much as one might have feared, and again last year when they didn't increase as much as expected despite a strong economy. Expectations are very hard to shift, but I recognize this as success, not failure. As a result, short-term interest rates are a pretty blunt instrument. I do believe they work over time, but with long, la long lags and an imprecise impact. Small rate moves are unlikely to do much to move settled routines. And large moves run the risk of targeting 2% but delivering 4 What's happening sector by sector in the real economy can help or hurt the transmission of any rate moves. Right now, with productivity up relative to the last few years, accommodation is not having its usual effect. The consumer sector factors I discussed earlier also dampen inflation today, as do things like healthcare regulation, the decline in unionization, and industries, like utilities, that pass tax cuts on to customers. There is some potential offset from tariffs, but retaliatory tariffs and resulting industry overcapacity could take pricing the other way. Net, today, these real drivers may be having a much more significant impact than monetary ones. As a result, humility is a monetary policy virtue. The data aren't perfect, and inflation may well be closer to target than one might think, as suggested by measures like the Dallas trim mean. It strikes me as tricky to intervene in pursuit of an imprecise benefit. If one tries too hard to use low rates to get reflation, you might end up, not for the first time, with excess leverage and frothy valuations. And with the Phillips curve so flat, there are likely especially long lags in the effects of rate moves. The FOMC shifted its stance in January. It'll take inflation some time to react to the significant flattening signaled in the future rate path even as we may experience even lower unemployment. I want to help lower the volume on this. The more one says you're short of target, the more you risk convincing people that you won't hit that target. Firms don't move their expectations a tenth of a point at a time, but perhaps in whole numbers. In that context, inflation expectations are pretty stable. I hope to help keep them that way by not messaging a self-fulfilling prophecy. Finally, we all have to avoid complacency. The Fed has worked hard over the past three decades to keep inflation expectations anchored, but as future generations forget about the great inflation, we have to remember that anchored expectations are not a right, they are earned. An economy can run only so hot for so long before creating conditions you'll regret. The Fed held a recent conference on potential monetary policy frameworks in Chicago in June. The perspectives just outlined inform my views. I support changes that acknowledge the imprecision of what the FOMC is trying to do, say by establishing a target range for inflation or looking at multiple metrics, as Canada has done. But I'm wary of trying to do too much. I'm not yet convinced about strategies beyond zero lower bound forward guidance that commit to taking actions in the future. Will those strategies really be understood and believed? <laughs>
Given settled routines and embedded expectations, will they have the desired impact? And if not, what will future policymakers be signed up for? I would note the research that suggests multiple equilibria near the zero lower bound and fear that moving too quickly, focuses, moving too quickly focused on inflation risks could in turn focus attention on inflation in ways that lower expectations, creating a low rate, low inflation scenario like that found in Europe and Japan. Now the question you may actually be waiting for me to answer, what does this all mean for the paths of interest rates? In my view, with inflation muted, there isn't much case for stepping on the brakes. And with unemployment so low and consumer spending so healthy, it's equally hard to make a case for stepping on the gas. As I've discussed today, I don't see the current levels of inflation or inflation expectations as a trigger for additional accommodation. The potential to use rate changes to alter firms' settled routines is small and the potential cost of overreaching, as I outlined earlier, feels real. That said, I am tracking closely the environment for growth, which includes not only hard data, but also the softer and vital information on consumer and business confidence. If growth or confidence falters, I would certainly make the case to my peers that we should pay attention to it and do what we can to support continued economic expansion. Thank you, and I look forward to your questions. Now we're going, we're going Thank you very much. Are we are we on? This button. Jill, are we in good shape? Good. Thank you very much, President Barkin. So Maybe I'll just start off with one question. There's been a lot of attention in the markets to market measures of inflation expectations, ties into what's being expressed with the yield curve. Would that inform your view, or do you think that's more of a secondary metric? Well, I look at that. Can you hear me now? Oh, yeah, yeah, you certainly can. So, so I look at that and also look at survey-based uh, measures. I think if we're honest, none of those measures are particularly perfect for what we're really trying to get at. Um, if term premiums are down at the long rate of the, at, at, with the long bonds, then that'll affect what the five-year, five-year will show. Um, when you ask consumers what their inflation expectations are, how do they process it? Um, I think it is worth looking at them over time, and particularly the survey measures uh, over time. Uh, but I really do think there's a lot of noise in the market uh, measures. And so I look at them, but I'm trying hard as I talk to uh, business context to ask them the fundamental question. Have you changed your routines? How are you thinking about pricing in your business today? How do you think about it before? What's changing? And I think that's, at least for me, the best metric. Thank you. I think we'll take some questions from the audience. Jill uh, Fornito will bring around a microphone if you could wait for that uh, for the benefit of everyone. We'd appreciate it. One in the front here. Uh, thank you, President Barkin. Clearly, you're a quick learner. You sound like a central banker after only a my, year or two. My research director is here, and he would have a different point of view. <laughs> <laughs> let, let me play off confidence, because I would argue that the Fed is contributing to the lack of confidence in the economy. In every recession in the last 30 years, the Fed has been able to cut cash rates by five percentage mm -hmm. points or more. And the decision rule, the reaction function, was pretty clear. Um, that's not going to work in the next recession. So what does the Fed do after it uses its 200 basis points of rate uh, ammunition? Because I would argue the private sector honestly doesn't know. And because it doesn't know, it's very afraid mm -hmm. of the downturn that's inevitable. So we have tools. We have the ability to cut rates down to zero. Uh, we have the ability to do forward guidance, as we did the last time. Uh, we have the ability to do more quantitative easing, uh, like we did uh, last time. And so, if you will, those are the core tools in our toolbox right now. Um, and I would point, uh, as was pointed 10 years ago, but I think maybe not as pointedly, that there are also fiscal tools. You know, when I was in school, I learned it was monetary policy and fiscal policy, not just monetary. And so I think we shouldn't count on just one entity to do it. We ought to count on both monetary and fiscal at the same time. Um, we are engaged in this review right now of our framework and our tools. And there's a lot of ideas being put on the table for additional things we could do, things like price level targeting or uh, of that ilk. Um, as I you know, just said, I, I'm still uh, trying to understand and evaluate them. Uh, and I put forward you know, a second ago what I think are the major challenges in my mind. 
But I think we are looking for uh, additional tools to the extent they're warranted. President Barkin, one thing you did not mention, there was negative interest rates, negative policy rates that have been used uh, abroad. Uh, would you have an opinion on them, or would you say it's too early to say if those could be used in the U.S.? Uh, my mom is mostly in CDs, and she has an opinion on them. <laughs> I, I think uh, policymakers looked at that 10 years ago, and I think for some very good reasons backed away from it. Um, I'm certainly open to everything, but my ingoing bias would be that they made a pretty good decision at that time. Other questions from the audience? In the back? David? Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you. At the roundtable panel uh, two days ago on Trout Ranch, we discussed 14 trillion negative interest rate high-grade sovereign debt in the world. An average high-grade sovereign debt interest rate worldwide of approximately 1%. The Fed funds rate, other than for the 30-year Treasury in the United States, higher than 95% of the high-grade quality sovereign debt of the world. My question. Does that influence the discussions and the policy making at the FOMC? And I, I think you really asked two questions. You know, one is uh, the continued existence of low interest rates in the rest of the world, does that affect us? And the second is uh, the shape of the yield curve in the US, uh, does that affect us? And I think uh, I and we pay attention to both of those things quite significantly. Um, you know, in particular, uh, We've had over the uh, last several years uh, a pretty lengthy debate on the neutral rate of interest and how far could you take interest rates to the prior question. And there's no doubt in my mind that the rest of the world is relevant uh, in, that, in that conversation, if only the flow of assets that, flow, that is flowing into our tenure. Uh, it's also true when you look at the yield curve, that historic inversion. I should point that most of the analysis points to the two-year tenure, not the three-month tenure. And the two-year tenure has not yet uh, inverted, but uh, and that has you know uh, has seemed to have predictive power in the past as well. And so I look at both of those things. Question for Megan. Yeah, thanks. You mentioned that more accommodation could risk um, increasing leverage and creating frothy markets. I was just wondering if you see any markets that already look a bit frothy to you, and if so, do you think that they could spark the next recession, or or like in most credit cycles, might just make it a bit worse? Yeah, and to be clear, um, cutting to try to get more inflation is what I was talking about. If, if you need to cut to get more growth, I don't think that makes markets frothy. That stimulates growth. So it, to me, it's a very different situation. If you take a full growth and you stimulate because you want to get prices up a little as opposed to you take short of growth. Um, well, I, I think the way I think about it is there are uh, asset markets. And of course, I'll mention the ones that everyone mentions like uh, corporate lending that certainly appear you know, more significantly levered than they ever, ever have before. I think the other way to look at the question is institutions. And uh, you know, we have a pretty good eye uh, through our role on the banking sector, but not a great role eye on the rest of the um, financial markets. And so I might point at uh, markets like lending, but I'd equally point at you know, the places that we don't have that much transparency. And you could go anywhere from the European banking system to um, CLO funds at hedge funds and otherwise. That, that's where I'd be more concerned. Question in the back. Given that there are only a handful of 25 basis point rate cuts, given where rates are today, does that make the bar higher for the first move or, or is that not factor in? Um, you know, you get into this uh, mental debate about, you know, do you spend today or save for tomorrow? And a lot has to do with uh, what you think the um, impact of those, the relative impact of those two things are. Uh, there has been a bunch of research, and I've read it, and it, it makes intuitive sense to me, that says if you've decided growth falters and you want to do something, then moving faster is better than moving slower. I think that is a... Um, a, a pretty thoughtful piece of research, and I think it makes a good sense, given the limitations we were talking about in the zero lower bound. Um, 
Uh, that doesn't mean you should move today. To, you, have, you have to do the diagnosis to say that it's time to move. But if you do that diagnosis, probably faster is better than slower, I would think. Another question in the back. So in the Great Recession, the Fed introduced payment of interest on reserves, which has been argued to be a subsidy for larger banks and sterilization of the monetary policy. Do you see the Fed moving away from interest on reserve, or is that here to stay? Um, uh, in the conversations I've been in, and, and this is not my technical expertise, so we've now exposed me completely, but uh, I, in the conversations I've been in, my understanding is it is a uh, simpler and more uh, uh, accurate way to have interest rate control than the quarter system we used in the past. And because of that, I think uh, the folks in the markets group seem to me to be very uh, interested in maintaining that. Maybe I could ask a question based on some of your work uh, with the private sector in setting mm -hmm. wages and, and mm -hmm. expectations. And you said inflation expectations matter. If inflation expectations in the U.S. were to become de-anchored to the downside, yeah. and we were going to look like Japan, how long would that take based on what you've seen in the process of how firms set wages? Is that a, a year-long process? Does this take five years? In other words, if we were going mm -hmm. the direction where wage uh, expectations and inflation expectations were indeed sliding, is that a yeah. quick or a slow process? And maybe let me answer for both wages and prices, because I think it's an interesting uh, challenge. Um, on prices right now, uh, if you're the purchasing manager at, say, Walmart, um, uh, you think inflation is going to be 2%. So you're a hero if you bring back zero. And so the purchasing manager at Walmart wakes up every morning, looks at his supply base or her supply base, and says, how am I going to get that to zero? And so if you're in apparel manufacturer and you come into Walmart and you say, oh, my wages are up, I need to get 3 or 4%, they say, screw you, it's zero. Or I'm going to bid it, or I'm going to go to China, or I'm going to do private label, or whatever. Um, uh, on the pricing side, uh, I do worry that if it becomes clear in people's minds that the number is zero, not two, that the purchasing manager is going to be a hero at a different number. Right? So I, I think that would happen actually relatively suddenly if that thing became clear. Wages are another matter. Um, in 2009, I was the CFO of my old firm. Uh, obviously, inflation was not strong in 2008 and 9, and so at the end of the year, I tried to make the case to my colleagues that our merit increase shouldn't be 3%, it should be 2.9%, and that did not happen, <laughs> right? Uh, and words were used that I'm not going to repeat. So I think on the wage side, it's pretty embedded. And um, if you think about the big things that have happened to the detriment of labor over the last 30 or 40 years, think defined benefit to define contribution or getting rid of pension plans is a classic uh, example, or uh, employees contributing for health care would be another thing. Um, there are a number of really big, really leading companies that influence. They tend to move first, and it takes five or ten years for people to follow. That doesn't happen uh, immediately, and that's what I would expect on the wage side as well. So we saw the chart earlier where we had the employment cost index versus some of the small business plans to mm -hmm. uh, change what they were doing. And it looked like the wage numbers, or the compensation numbers here, were actually a bit low relative to history. Would say that that probably doesn't catch up fast in this yeah. type of world we're describing here. Would that be a fair thought process? Yeah. I, I, though I think what's happening on the employment side is uh, yeah, at entry level, right? Uh, and largely the less educated, you know, think truck drivers, think uh, construction, think tellers at a bank, think waiters or service people at a restaurant. That market is incredibly tight. And so, uh, not, and people say, well, what happens to wages? It's incredibly tight and wages are increasing at levels like you would think, right? The part that's not as tight and wages aren't increasing is actually the higher income side. Uh, think college educated, uh, think your head of marketing or your marketing analyst. And what's happening there is the market is tight, but business people don't really think that they could pass on increases. So they're a little more reluctant to do it. Um, you don't have quite the same urgency to bring somebody in at that level. You can wait a month or two for the right person. Um, employers have been investing a bunch in uh, employee experience. And I don't think they're doing it for fun. I think they're doing it because they think they matter. And so turnover of that class isn't at the levels we saw in 2007, well, just to 2007, but not in 99. 
where you saw real increases in, in that group. And so I think that group, if you will, that pot hasn't overheated the way the entry level pot seems to me to have overheated. And so some of the labor shortage arguments that we would often hear about, those do come in the, the categories like truck drivers or some yes. of those uh, experiences. So it would sound like there you are seeing from your business context Absolutely. what you expect to see, and, and maybe some of the models are working. It's just in different no, areas in the are. economy. Uh, by the way, you could, it's different, but I think it's also happening in tech, data analysts, you know, the particular functions. But again, the classic uh, managerial class, if you put it that way, that's where I think it hasn't yet overheated. Got it. Let me pause for a second and see if there are other questions from the audience. We have one on the uh, side here. Uh, my question is uh, something that nobody ever really talks about. It seems to be the new paradigm that everybody's okay with, but um, the government debt and the irresponsible spending of both Congress and the, at the executive level and 22 trillion, whatever, is it okay to be at you know 125 percent debt to GDP if another country is at 200 percent? I mean, I, I guess my question is. What's your opinion on how that's going to end and when? Do we have to inflate our weight out? I mean, what, what's going to happen? Is it just okay? Um, yeah, so just some is. facts for people who aren't as grounded in it as you are. 2007, debt to total GDP was in the range of 37, 38%. Today, it's in the range of 78%. CBO estimates suggest with relatively conservative assumptions about additional fiscal stimulus uh, and this in what happens in even the budget negotiations right now take it to about 98 percent by 2027 um, if you don't make those conservative assumptions you're certainly over hundred percent by 2027 uh, Italy you'll know better I think is at 140 Japan I think is at around 200 so um, uh, Ain't yet the 10 year bond and the 30 year bond are at historic lows. So that's the situation as we see it. Uh, I completely think that uh, uh, this fiscal path is unsustainable and not okay. Um, uh, I'm reminded of the quote in the, the F. Scott Fitzgerald quote about Jay Gatsby, uh, who, who, or I think he described someone as going bankrupt gradually and then suddenly. And I think there's nothing immediate that suggests that markets will leave us and people won't want to buy u.s bonds but you can't run this forever and believe that people won't do it so if you will there's a really significant embedded rate hike that's how it hits you right uh, rates go up somewhere in the future that will be done by some institution that's not the fed but instead by a bunch of investors in u.s debt now is there any other answer uh the one other answer that i think is actually pretty compelling and politically politically palatable is growth Right, and th these answers are very different if we grow at 3% than if we grow at 2%. And I go back to what you know, multiple people said earlier, that involves building a stronger, bigger workforce and more productivity. And I think that probably can and should be a conversation we could get our heads around. We're just not uh, doing it the way we need to yet. So in market and political circles recently, there has been an increased discussion of the modern monetary theory, the MMT, approach to budgets and mm -hmm. to spending uh, in, in Washington. Is that informing your process at all? Is that something that is being considered or is it still out of the mainstream? Uh, I'm still trying to find uh, a research paper that tells me what it is. So I, I, I'm very interested in understanding it and if there's there there, I'd certainly listen to it. But I, I don't think there's yet um, a paper that describes it. Question on the side? Yes, hello, good morning. Um, we, we heard talk this morning about you know, issues in China and, and Europe and other parts of the world, and of course here. The one thing I haven't heard discussed, and I wonder if you have an opinion, is the situation really in sort of the global euro dollar market and what we're seeing there with the, the euro what? The euro dollar. And how, dollar. how the euro dollar might be affecting, or the, the, the global shortage of dollars, as some people have viewed it, might be affecting you know, both. China, Europe, and, and also potentially the U.S. Yeah, I don't have a particular perspective on that. I'm sorry. Maybe we could phrase it as, do you think global growth matters being the U.S. central bank? Oh, for sure. Would, would you yeah. uh, I mean, put that as a 
top uh, level factor or second level factor? I mean, I would, uh, I would give this economy great credit for having gone through the Great Recession and have lifted the way it has over the last two or three years or even over the last 10. Um, you give it even more credit when you compare it to the economies in Europe or Japan and other developed countries that just don't seem to have had the lift that ours has. Um, I think the lack of lift in other places, though, constrains us. It constrains us in how far you could take up rates and therefore how much ammunition you'd have. It constrains us in terms of uh, growth because, you know, uh, import-export rates, maybe that's what you're getting at. Uh, and I do think it would be good for this economy to have the rest of the world growing at a very different rate. A question in the back from Bill? How about the environment for saving uh, in the economy? Uh, if you look at uh, the amount of interest that consumers declare on their tax returns starting in 2009, it plummeted. It only now has gotten about to the same dollar amount as it was back then. Uh, <clears throat> so what, what, what is happening for, the, uh, for savers and the incentive that they have to save, and also how they, how they hold their money? You know, there's, a, there's an old rule about uh, the composition of your portfolio. The older you get, the higher the percentage you have in bonds and in fixed income. And of course, I know I have a lot of friends who are the reverse of that. You know, they have very little in bonds. Uh, and they have everything, uh, in, in, or almost everything, in the stock market uh, because there's just no return mm -hmm. in bonds. It doesn't, that's, I mean, the Fed wanted us to take more risk, but I'm not sure they wanted us to take that kind of risk. We can have a lot of people in big trouble if the market goes down. Well, I, I teased about my uh, mom and her CDs earlier, but it's a real thing, and it's a real thing that I see live as I, you know, try to help her with her finances. I, I was um, pleased last year that we were able to get um, uh, the Fed funds rate above the uh, rate of inflation, because at least that meant for savers, there was some real uh, money being returned to them. And I do think the value to savers is part of the monetary policy you know, outcome package that gets too little coverage. I mean, we talk a lot about borrowing costs and constraining the economy, but I do think, and certainly when I talk to savers I hear it loud and clear. So I, I, I am hopeful that we can have an economy with enough strength to preserve rates that are such that they give uh, that kind of return to savers. I agree. So we have time for about two more questions. Maybe I'll ask one here. Uh, President Barker, you mentioned there's a situation where we have a strong economy but fragile confidence. Yeah. And it seems awfully strange that that would last. Do you have any sense of how long we could go with this type of world or uh, when you would expect those two to converge or do you think this is something that we could just be looking at as a new normal? Yeah, it feels to me like it's hard to be fragile for a continuing period. You have to either, you know, lower your concern or raise your com raise your confidence or or make a decision the other way. Um, you know, it first started to see it in my mind at the end in the fourth quarter of last year. Uh, continuing on into the first quarter. Um, but as I wandered around my district in the middle of the second quarter, uh, I'll say April, May, I actually heard people had settled down quite a lot. Um, so I was reasonably hopeful that we'd reached a, a decent place and uh, that underlay my perspective and my forecast for the economy. Um, when you get to uh, May and June and you had the noise about trade and, uh, and other things like that, uh, um, it started to go a little bit south again, and that um, informed my perspective when we met even, you know, four weeks ago. Uh, I've been out in the last four weeks, and I'm talking to business people, and again, I'm just, I'll just tell you, what they're telling me is, um, last year they were leaning forward. They're not yet leaning back. I mean, they're not cutting jobs, they're not um, cutting investments that have already been underway, but they're cautious, and they're cautious because of this uh, fragility. And I do think if we had some period of time with the perspective of a stable environment for business investment, they would move forward. They haven't stopped, they've just slowed. And so I do think there's a, a positive uh, path for the economy that's potentially ahead of us. And of course, there are negative paths. One final question from the audience. This is probably a, a dumb question, but looking around, I know several people here who won't know the answer to this as well, so I'll, I'll ask it. But so it's we, really not that dumb. You're just asking for your friend. <laughs> yeah, exactly, <laughs> exactly. 
Well, when, when we talk about lowering interest rates to stimulate a, a country's economy, uh, even negative interest rates, whereas we have a global economy, what, what precludes somebody from another country going and borrowing at a lesser rate than from their own country? Um, well, I think that's the carry trade, and a lot of uh, a, a lot of investment firms actually do that trade, where you you know borrow in one currency, invest in the other currency, and of course the gap is your currency. So you have to believe the currency is stable. And um, my understanding is the carry trade is profitable nine times out of ten. You just don't want to be there the tenth time. Well, with that, I think we will conclude. Yeah, good. We're scheduled thank you for very a break. Much. Let me say thank you much to President Barton. Thanks for doing that. Thank you.